So welcome, everyone. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Alberto Nicolas. Uh, so I've known Alberto for you know, a bit more than 10 years. Probably. And one thing I've, I've noticed is the wide variety of topics that he's worked on in that time and um, also before. So he started his PhD in Italy working on gravity waves. And this was back before gravity waves were cool. Um, and then he moved to a postdoc in Spain and then at Harvard, and then to Columbia. And he's worked on topics in theoretical cosmology, on inflation, on uh, Galileans. Um, so these are effective field theories. Um, and most recently, he's moved turned his attention to uh, fluids, to effective theories of fluids and vortices. Um, and even to topics beyond physics. Um, today, he'll tell us about ethology. If you don't know what that means, you should be ashamed of yourself. It's a very common English term. <laughs> In fact, I had no idea what it meant until 15 minutes ago. It's uh, the science of animal behavior. And that's going to play a role in this talk, as you'll see. So, um, uh, away, Thank you very much for the invitation and for the nice introduction. So, yeah, I have um, the title of my talk is String Theory in the Beta, perhaps a more descriptive, uh, this, uh, descriptive subtitle is this one. So, I want to talk about string like objects that exist in fluids and superfluids, these are vortex lines and vortex rings, how they interact with sound, and uh, uh, also about rotons, which are uh, microscopic quantum degrees of freedom of liquid helium, and they are sort of relatives of these uh, vortex lines and vortex rings. And uh, uh, as you see, um, I will use uh, perhaps an unfamiliar language to describe all these things. And that is the language of effective field theory and effective string theory. Hence the title, string theory in the bathtub. So uh, let me first uh, review for you uh, what's the difference between a zero temperature superfluid and an ordinary fluid. So usually we say a superfluid is a fluid without viscosity in which there are no dissipative phenomena. And that's true. But uh, uh, from the hydrodynamical equations viewpoint, Viscosity is already uh, what we call a, a higher derivative uh, effect, meaning it's a subleading uh, term in, uh, in uh, Navier-Stokes equation, subleading at log distances, meaning if you have perturbations away from thermodynamic equilibrium, which uh, have long wavelengths compared to, let's say, the mean free path of your fluid, uh, viscosity uh, is a weak effect. So for instance, sound waves, the longer they are, meaning the longer the wavelengths, the more long-lived they are. They dissipate away energy through viscosity, but for longer and longer wavelengths, viscosity is always a subleading effect. And so it's, I, I think it's important instead to characterize the difference uh, between fluids and superfluids in terms of degrees of freedom, which is a difference that is already there uh, at the zero derivative order, in a sense. Okay? So the claim is this, that on the left, I have superfluids, and on the right, ordinary fluids. At the level of compressional modes, they are both described by hydrodynamics. So they obey the same equations of motion, the hydrodynamical equations. So if you want sound is the same in both cases, it behaves in the same way, even at nonlinear level. Uh, in particular, for superfluids, you can also quantize the sound, and the quanta of sound are called phonons. <clears throat> but uh, uh, at the level of transverse excitations, by transverse, I mean they are not longitudinal waves, but they sort of act in the transverse direction compared to the their gradients. Uh, so these are the vortices. And uh, in an ordinary fluid, you can have uh, a huge variety of vortices, OK? Meaning the, the, the vorticity field, the curl of the velocity field, can be a fairly arbitrary function of space and time. Its time dependence is given by the equations of motion, but you can set up arbitrary initial conditions for it, OK? So in particular, you can make vortices as soft as you want. By soft, I mean that they can have as little energy as you want. You can stir a fluid as slowly as you want. Okay? Not so for a superfluid. In a superfluid, uh, in the bulk of a superfluid, vorticity has to be zero. Okay? And it can only be non-zero on uh, line-like defects, which are called vortex lines. So these are lines. Okay, and uh, uh, you, can, you should think of the line as a placeholder for where vorticity is non-zero. So the, the curl of the velocity field is localized on the line, which means that 
velocity, the velocity field goes around the line like this in a one over r fashion, exactly like the magnetic field around a wire decays in a one over r fashion. Okay? So in general, you should think of a vortex line, of the line itself, as a placeholder for a fairly delocalized velocity field around it. Okay? And this delocalization will play a role in what we are going to talk about. Okay? Now, even though in, flu in ordinary fluids we can have much more general vortices, whereas in superfluids we can only have these ones, in ordinary fluids we can also set up configurations that look pretty much like this. Now, in a superfluid like helium-4, the thickness of this line is of, of, of order of the Bohr radius, so it's really a microscopic distance. In an ordinary fluid like water, I can set up a vortex line like this, and the thickness is essentially a free parameter. It can be a millimeter, a centimeter. I'll show you videos in which both these scales are realized. And, uh, but as long as I'm interested in phenomena that happens at much longer scales than that thickness, so let's say I take a vortex uh, line whose typical, uh, let's say, curvature is, I don't know, a meter or something, compare, and, uh, and the thickness is a centimeter or a millimeter, I, I can certainly, uh, in first approximation, I can treat the, the line as an infinitesimal, of, as, uh, as if it had infinitesimal thickness, okay? And why do I want to do that? Because, you see, to keep track of the time evolution of a more general vortex configuration, you really need full three-dimensional information about a vector field, the velocity field, okay? So you really need a lot of data, and it's not obvious how to visualize this thing. Whereas to keep track of how something like this moves, you only need to look at the line, okay? And remember that the line is a placeholder for, the, for a non-trivial velocity field around this. But once you know the shape of the line, you can reconstruct the velocity field around it, as I will describe. So it's much easier to think of the dynamics of these vortices rather than this, because you can parameterize them with fewer numbers if you want. You just need to follow the shape of that line. Yeah? You have explained gap and gapless. Yes, thank you very much. Yes. So here by gapless, I mean that I need, uh, I don't need, there's no energy gap, meaning I'm talking, I'm using gap not in a quantum uh, sense, but even classical. I'm saying I need, uh, I, can, I can set up a vortex configuration which, with as little energy as possible in an ordinary fluid. Whereas in a superfluid, these objects are quantized, in particular the integral of the velocity field around them is quantized, and so there's an energy gap associated with setting up a solution like this, okay? And in fact, uh, the energy per unit length of an object like this diverges logarithmically, both at short distances, as we will see, and at large distances. So, and there's a non-trivial energy to set it up. Why do I emphasize this? Because for instance, if I were to work at very low energies and just looking at uh, uh, collisions of uh, phonons, at very low energies I will never be able to produce such an object from low energy collisions of phonons. Whereas in ordinary fluids, uh, vortices are very easy to set up. What about very small flows? Very good, so yeah, it has an energy that depends, uh, so a vortex ring, yes, that, that, that energy scales with the radius in some way, as we will see. And um, in particular, the rotons, which are like the quantum version of those, uh, are, uh, are still gapped, as we will see. But the, the funny thing is that uh, when you, well, I'll, I'll talk about this later, but somehow there's no, when you really go to microscopic distances and look at smaller and smaller and smaller rings, the spectrum is continuously connected to the spectrum of the phonons. So somehow, quantum mechanics merges the two excitations, the vortex rings and the phonons. I'll talk about this later. And the reason is that they have the same quantum numbers at some level. We'll see this later. Okay. So let me describe, first of all, the phenomenology of how these things move. Because you see, they, they move in very unconventional ways, in the sense that if you just think of them as string-like objects, we have an intuition about how a string-like object moves. If you throw a shoelace in outer space, then if you apply forces to it, each line element will move according to the forces that you apply to it in the usual way. And you see that these things don't move like that at all, okay? And so it's kind of difficult from the level of equations of motion to figure out what's the time evolution of a system made of these vortices, okay? So uh, the first sign that they are very unconventional comes from this analogy. So, 
We're talking about, uh, uh, we're interested in figuring out the velocity field, okay, and in particular the velocity of each line element of a vortex ring, of a vortex line like this. So in, in first approximation, let me take an incompressible fluid, and then I'll talk about how to couple to compressional modes later. But for the moment, let's assume that uh, the fluid is incompressible. So the velocity field is divergence-free for an incompressible fluid, and all the information is contained in the curl of the velocity field, which is the vorticity. Okay? Now, if you take a line like this, you could uh, integrate the uh, vorticity, so the curl of V, on a cross-section of the line, which by Stokes' theorem is the same as integrating the velocity field around the line. Okay? And uh, so this defines a quantity gamma, which is conserved along the line. Okay? It's the same wherever you compute it. And, uh, and uh, not only that, but it turns out that in the absence of viscosity, so if we neglect viscosity, it's, uh, it's conserved in time as well. Okay? Now, uh, remember that this was the, the integral, the cross-sectional integral of the curl of V. So I can interpret V as a magnetic field and this object as a current flowing in the line. And in particular, this would be, these circles here would be exactly the profiles of the magnetic field around a current carrying wire, okay? So given this analogy, if I give you the shape of the line and how much current there is, meaning what's the circulation, this gamma is called the circulation, you can immediately reconstruct the velocity field everywhere in space just by the bio, standard bio savara integral, okay? Because the equations are exactly the same. You have a divergence-free vector field whose current density omega is associated with this line current, okay? So the, the velocity field everywhere in space for a given line is defined by this integral where the, the integral runs along the line, okay? Now it turns out, and this is just a consequence of the hydrodynamical equations of motion, that when you extrapolate, so this is the velocity field of the fluid surrounding the line, but when you extrapolate the velocity field to the line itself, this is a consequence of certain equations of hydrodynamics, in particular Kelvin's theorem, so-called Kelvin's theorem. When you extrapolate the velocity field of the fluid to the line itself, that also gives you the local velocity of the line itself. Okay? So the line moves with this velocity field extrapolated to any point along the line. That's the claim. Okay? So there are several annoying... Uh, so you can interpret this if you want. For a given geometry of the line, you take this integral. This is the equation of motion of the line. So there's two annoying features of this equation of motion. One, it's uh, an integral differential equation. So it's not a simple differential equation. You have, to, you have a, a differential on the left-hand side. I mean, this is x dot, so the derivative with respect to time. And on the right-hand side, you have an integral. And uh, uh, the second, perhaps more physical uh, uh, and uh, interesting aspect is that it's a first-order equation of motion, meaning it determines the velocity in terms of the position of the line and not the acceleration. It doesn't determine the acceleration. It tells you directly the velocity. It's the first order equation of motion. So it's completely unlike acceleration equals forces. Okay? So in particular, there's no room for forces. So if you come up with a new force, for instance, you want to describe how sound pushes on this thing, you cannot parameterize that in terms of a force, because that equation is not acceleration equals something, so you cannot add the forces to it. If you want to understand how gravity acts on it, do these, thing, these things uh, sink or float? You cannot think in terms of gravitational forces, okay? There's no, there's no room in this equation of motion to put corrections on the right-hand side in terms of forces. So you have to come up with a better description. Also, you are not free to, de to, to, to decide an initial condition for V. So, uh, usually in a mechanical system, let's say a system of point particles, we give, we give positions and velocities initially, and then the equations of motion take care of the rest. Here, you just need to give the initial shape, and then the equation of motion tells you the velocity directly in terms of the geometry. So, it's a very unconventional equation of motion. And in fact, it's very difficult to first not only because it's a first order, but also because it's an integral differential equation. It's very difficult to uh, integrate it, meaning to understand how these things, for a given geometry, how these things evolve in time. And people usually just do it numerically. 
Okay, they put it on a computer and they do the integral numerically and then they follow. And, uh, um, and uh, now, from... Uh, I'm going to sorry. Yeah. But gamma is, an, I mean, it's a fixed number, right? Gamma is a fixed number in time and along the line. It's a number associated with the line. And in fact, for liquid helium, it's quantized. So it's a question just an integral. There's no view on the other side. Yes. Yeah, sorry, but the, the integral runs along the line. So this is V at any given x on the line. And the integral runs along the line. So it's, uh, once you're given a geometry, let's say I give you an initial geometry for the line, let's say a circle. You do the integral at a given t. That gives you the instantaneous velocity. But now the shape will change because of that velocity. So you'd have to do the integral again. You see what I mean? So I, I mean that that integral. This looks like an integral, but you can simply replace it. I mean, but it's a, you see, it's a, it's a one-dimensional integral. Yeah, so whatever it is, it's an integral. You can take it, and then it's a function. Right? I, I don't see why it's an integral equation. So let's say that, well, because let's say that this curve, the the, the string is uh, let's let's take a closed string, for instance, no? And let's say it's gamma, okay? Now this uh, so this integral is along gamma. And this is dx over dt of the string. OK? Now, the moment the string moves with this velocity, so you go from t to t plus dt, gamma will change. Now you have this string. So then I understand. Now the integral is different. About how, but I understand how this equation. And you agree that this equation is an integral. Just, there's an integral which I can say is the no, but I, perhaps, uh, I mean, here there should be a gamma under this integral, meaning it's a one-dimensional integral along, along a curve that will evolve in time. And the way the curve evolves in time is given by v. You see what I mean? Ah, okay, so the curve is the, is the, the, curve is the additional information. Yes, exactly. Meaning it's, uh, it's, you have to take a one-dimensional integral along a given curve yeah. at equal 0. Then at t equal 0 plus dt, the curve will be slightly different because. Yeah, that, it's c, c, anyway, sorry, right, there's a down. gamma, there's a, there's a little gamma there, and gamma is a function of v. Well, it's not a function. Well, it's not a function of. Sorry, I'm. Um, so maybe, maybe I'm being uh, sloppy with that notation. So I'm just saying that. The integral is take in dx prime, so this is dx prime, is along the string itself, okay? And uh, I, I can compute at any given time, I can compute this integral, so it only depends on these distances and these vectors, etc. okay? But then the left hand side is really the velocity at which each line element, for instance this guy, is moving, okay? And so now, the curve is slightly different at a subsequent time, and so the integral I have to compute it again. So that No, no, I understand that the process is very complicated. That I'm not questioning that. I'm just saying that this, I was trying to understand whether this equation is written in a closed form that you can just. It's hard, but it could integrate. Because if it depends on gamma, then I don't understand why this equation is even closed. Uh, because then gamma, I should know how v and gamma, I don't know. So v is the local velocity of any lime element of gamma. You see what I mean? So gamma is really the string itself. V is the velocity of any line element of the string. No, I understand that. I'm just, yeah, but this equation you're saying is enough. So it's hard yes. to solve, but it's enough. Yes. If you use it gamma. Yes. Okay. Now, it's, yeah, impor sorry. it's important that the viscosity of the fluid was assumed to be zero. Yes. And so you're telling us something about the Euler equation, right? Yes, Euler, yeah. That's it. Yeah, uh, for the moment, no dissipation. It happens that capital gamma is quantized, but for, for now you're not even... Yeah, in fact, uh, in fact, I mean, everything I say can be applied also to ordinary fluids in which gamma is not quantized. To Euler. For, to Euler, yeah, if in the limit in which I neglect viscosity, okay? But you see in the videos that it's a pretty good uh, approximation, at least in certain cases. Um, sorry, maybe we should talk offline about this, but this, yeah. Uh, this integral does not diverge only because of the cross product. 
It does diverge logarithmically, and I'll talk about those divergences. Yeah, but only logarithmically because of the cross product. Exactly. Yeah, otherwise it would diverge. If there is a corner in the curve, then it diverges much more dramatically. Yeah, I'm not able to, v whatever I say only applies to smooth curves. I'm not able to Does talk about singularities. Corners? <coughs> this dynamics, uh, that's a good question. No. Well, we'll see the videos. It doesn't generate corners. There are other situations, like for cosmic strings, they do generate cusps. Here they don't, no? Relativistic strings don't. Relativistic strings do generate cusps. These, they, they don't. Well, I don't have a theorem. I'm just looking at the videos. I don't see any cusps. Yeah. Experimental <laughs> physics. So the line doesn't cross. Hmm? The line doesn't cross. If it crosses, yeah, then it can reconnect. I'm assuming it doesn't cross. Yes, I'm not able to talk about crossings because those have to do with distances that are of order of the thickness. And so whatever I say will apply only to wavelengths that are much longer than the thickness. So, yeah, there's some non-trivial phenomenology associated with crossings. But yeah. experimentally, I think people were claiming that they always interconnect. These guys always interconnect, yes. Right. Unlike cosmic strings. Now, cosmic strings have a non-trivial probability. By all of one. That's yeah. People are using these experiments to I see. I see. Yeah, I, I think, uh, I think uh, whether they inter reconnect or not is really, is really a question that depends on the microphysics, meaning you really need to resolve what happens at the core and see what happens. And uh, here, because everything associated with some velocity fields that surround the lines, I think you can prove that they always reconnect. But in case of cosmic, cosmic strings, maybe you have a different... Well, Okay, let me keep going. Um, so, for vortex rings, which are again this, the same, but now closed, a, a vortex line closed onto itself, so in which the, let's say the, the velocity field is toroidal around the line, okay? That dynamics, when you do the, now you can do the integral, assuming that the ring is circular, you can actually do the integral because you have a lot of symmetries. You discover that the ring moves at a constant speed, which is determined by the radius. A is a UV cutoff, which you can interpret as the thickness of the string. And this is the logarithmic divergence we were talking about. Okay? And, uh, uh, and notice that, again, this is very unconventional. You cannot say, let me take a, a vortex ring at rest. No, it doesn't want to be at rest. So once you give the radius, the velocity at which it, move, it moves with respect to the surrounding fluid is fixed. And there's no contradiction because usually in empty space, let's say we are used to having all possible kinds of velocities. You can take something at rest, you can take something that moves at constant speed, but that's a consequence of Galilei invariance or Lorentz invariance that tells you that if this is a solution, this is also a solution, okay? Here, the fluid provides you with a fixed reference frame, okay? We say it breaks, it spontaneously breaks Lorentz or Galilei invariance. So there's no boost invariance anymore so uh, there's no guarantee that if this is a solution, this is also a solution. And in fact, this shows you that for vortex rings, there's only moving solutions with uh, a velocity given by the radius, the log of the radius, okay? Uh, I want to emphasize this, again, based on the magnetostatics analogy, because it's going to be useful later, that far away, so you can really think of, again, s since we were thinking of the line as a, a line current, now when you curl it up like this, you can think of this as a, as a, as, a, as a little uh, current uh, carrying ring, and uh, in particular, it's a magnetic dipole, okay? And remember that V was the analog of the magnetic field, so very far away, the velocity field generated by an object like this is that of a dipole, okay? With the dipole moment given by this combination, the normal vector times R square and gamma. That's gonna be useful later. Yes, exactly. So, there's a, so this is what I, what I can uh, uh, get from this integral is the velocity field in the surrounding fluid. Okay. Now it's a consequence of Euler equation again, in particular of Kelvin's theorem, which is just a rewriting of Euler equation. That as long as vorticity is localized on a line, that line will move with the surrounding fluid. So you just have to extrapolate the velocity field to the line itself. It's a consequence of 
Kelvin's theorem. But you're right, I mean, there's a, it's a possible source of confusion and one has to, has to be careful about that. Uh, finally, another interesting aspect of these systems is the spectrum of excitations. So let me take a straight string, let me slightly perturb it. Uh, many years ago, Lord Kelvin, well, of course he was not thinking in terms of superfluids, but he took, uh, uh, let's say, the hydrodynamical equations for a cylindrical vortex in water, let's say, and uh, he looked for solutions that were slightly perturbed. And what you find is that uh, um, there's two modes overall, which uh, is different from 2 plus 2. What I mean is the following. There's one mode going up and one mode going down. There's only one polarization going up and only one going down. Unlike an ordinary string in which it can vibrate this way and that way, both going up and going down. Okay? Not only that, they are both circularly polarized. So there's one circular polarization going up like this and one circular polarization going out like this. And you cannot combine them to, to make linear polarizations because to make linear polarization, you need two circular polarizations going with the same momentum, okay? So here you only have circular polarization. So in particular, you can say, okay, but what are you talking about? If I take this as initial condition, in which, let's say, the line is perturbed on the plane of the blackboard, so this is a linearly polarized initial condition, but I'm not free to choose the initial velocity because the equations of motion are first order. So the equation of motion will decompose this into a circular polarization going up and a circular polarization going down. So this linear polarization is only linear at, let's say, t equals zero or periodically at any given period. Okay? We'll see this phenomenon later in the video. And uh, uh, so, one, aspect of, one peculiar aspect of this is that there's fewer modes than the vibrating modes of a standard string. And the dispersion relation is funny. Not only is not linear in K, usually omega and K go together, meaning they, they, they are related linearly here, they're related quadratically and, in fact, quadratically plus a log correction. This log comes, again, from that divergence of that integral in the, in the, yeah, in the bios of our integral. Now, uh, again, k is the momentum, uh, or the wave number, and a is of order of the thickness of the string. We say, in field theory terms, we say that this is a local dispersion relation, meaning it's not a simple power of k, it's not polynomial in k. There is this funny log of k. Log of k does not behave as a power law when k goes to zero. And that's usually a sign that uh, we uh, are missing some degrees of freedom, meaning this, in field theory, is usually the result of what we say integrating, uh, what we call integrating out degrees of freedom, meaning having taken a system with, let's say, two degrees of freedom, you ignore one and you only look at the dynamics of the other, taking into account the indirect effects of the second one, you can get effects like this. And the same is true for this integral. We know that physics is fundamentally local, so the fact that we have a non-local equation of motion, meaning an equation of motion which on the right-hand side has an integral, means physically that this integral is the result of having solved the equations of motion for some other field and plugged them back into the uh, equation of motion that we're interested in. And, uh, and here, the, 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 that's clearly the case. And it's because, again, we are focusing just on the dynamics of the string, meaning we are just trying to follow the position of this one-dimensional object. But this one-dimensional object, once again, is a placeholder for a much more complicated velocity field that extends at large distances. Okay? So that's the extra field that we are ignoring. The velocity field that extends no locally, in a sense, away from the string, is responsible for giving us these no local things. And we will see that that's the case when we try to recast everything in field theory terms. I should probably accelerate, so let me show you the videos. So the first videos I got from William Irvine, who was uh, a postdoc here, actually. And uh, uh, he's been doing uh, interesting experiments with um, vortex lines and vortex rings. So these are data. These are not simulations, and uh, this is a very um, exotic fluid, also known as water, at room temperature and atmospheric pressure. Okay? 
and, uh, and uh, what you'll see is what? So it's going to set up uh, these um, vortex rings, OK? And to visualize them, so these are just vortex configurations with water, so you don't see much. But uh, what you can do is uh, you sprinkle tiny air bubbles. The air bubbles float to the region of least pressure. Turns out that for these configurations, the pressure is minimized at the core of the ring or the line. So what you see are these air bubbles that are stuck to the core of the ring. So the first video up here is just a circular vortex ring. It's pushing water through this wall and then sprinkling these air bubbles. You see that the air bubbles accumulate on the ring. Okay, And these are essentially uh, fully three-dimensional videos in the sense that uh, they are using a very fast laser scanning technique to get uh, three-dimensional information in real time. And so they can rotate the after they're taken, they can rotate the videos however they want. So you see some of these rotations later. So in this, in this case, it's going to pull this, uh, this shape through water. This shape leaves, uh, leaves behind a vortex. You see that it has this uh, sort of uh, triangular uh, structure. It's in a plane, so this is exactly a planar initial condition. And you see that the vortex will immediately develop circular polarizations, meaning it will immediately go out of plane. So that's what I was talking about, that even when you start with the planar initial conditions, there's only circularly polarized waves. You see the circularly polarized waves? And you see the three-dimensional videos, you can rotate them however you want. And then they are really interested in topological properties of these rings. In fact, I understand that they were the first to, to create topologically non-trivial rings, meaning rings knotted either on themselves or two rings knotted with each other. So this is a, a trifoil ring knotted onto itself. And these are two rings knotted. And so when these intersect, what, what do they do? They reconnect. They reconnect. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, the time, yeah, they're not evolving the system for, uh, for a long time, also because it's kind of messy. You see now, yeah, you, you'll see the other video. But uh, before I, I, I understand, so before I, I, I go to the other video, so. I understand that uh, for them, uh, I mean, th there's no real theory about, uh, for instance, the topology, meaning that they, they just have a 3D printer, they try whatever comes to mind, some shapes work, some don't. So it's an interesting trial and error experimental techniques. Now, there's other groups, like, uh, like Matt was mentioning. Uh, these dolphins, so they're clearly much better than Irvine in making these things, because uh, if you see, uh, now this is kind of... Uh, Perturbed, but there's there's some very clean ones. So for instance, these ones, and they they are very long lived. So they live for tens of seconds. You see, <laughs> and they can play with them. And uh, can you train them to make that? Very good. <laughs> Where did these rings come from? The, from the blowhole. So they they create. You see, they create a a, a vortex ring out of their blowhole. Some of them can do it, <laughs> others can't. They can teach each other. So I got in touch with a guy in Italy who runs a water park, and uh, he has this dolphin, so I asked him whether the trainers can train them to do experiments, like, I don't know, scattering experiments and stuff like that. <laughs> and uh, he didn't get back to me. <laughs> no, he told me, yes, well, that's interesting. I'm going to ask the trainers, but he never got back to me, so I don't know. But, um, and um, hmm? <laughs> <That's right. laughs> but, uh, but you see, one interesting feature, so we, so we were talking about uh, how difficult it is to understand the dynamics of these things. So you see here, so these are bubbles, OK? So again, the, the principle is the same. You see water, so you see air. Air flows to the center of the ring. Now, these are bubbles. But they don't float, no? So the, it's very, the dynamics of these things is very counterintuitive because what you see is the bubble, but in practice, the velocity field around it is so messy 
that the time evolution of these systems has very little to do with uh, what we are used to. And I'll talk about the coupling to gravity later, actually. OK. Apparently, it's very important for the dolphins to play with these things. So this is a, an article I found on the Journal of Comparative Psychology. So it's a cure for depression for dolphins, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and uh, apart, apart from the dolphins, so these are, as I said, these are uh, the only allowed vortices in superfluids, okay? In fact, they're quantized, so their gamma is quantized, and uh, this is the, the, the for, for a weakly coupled superfluid, this is what you have. M is the mass of the, let's say, for helium-4 is the mass of the helium atom. By the way, I find it funny that this ratio, which is the ratio of two microscopic numbers in our units, turns out to be a very reasonable number. So you could actually, and this is a purely of quantum origin, so you could actually see this quantum rotation because it would be a velocity of order millimeter per second uh, on a scale of a millimeter. So it's a visible quantum effect. And uh, since there are the only, the only allowed vortices in superfluids, uh, superfluid turbulence is defined as a tangled mass of these vortex lines. And there are questions about uh, how fast it can decay, because experimentally, so superfluid at very low temperatures, they have essentially zero viscosity. And uh, so it cannot decay because of dissipation. It cannot decay because of viscosity. But experimentally, it does decay. And so the question is, what are the channels that make it decay? For instance, one of the conjectures is it decays through emission of phonons. Okay? But in the equations I told you, there was no room for sound modes, meaning that those equations are only valid in the um, incompressible limit, and it's not obvious how to couple these things to sound. And my, my colleague at Columbia, another Ruderman, uh, tells me that uh, they also play an important role in pulsars, where uh, uh, vortex lines in the neutron superfluid interact strongly with the uh, magnetic flux tubes in the proton superconductor, okay? And this could have implication for the behavior of the star as a whole, in particular for star quakes that could be responsible, it tells me, for the observed glitches. Is that right? No. And recently, they've been observed, the vortex ring, also in uh, cold atom experiments. Okay? So these are important degrees of freedom in superfluids. Yes? So, so the, the water that you have, uh, that you showed in experiments, is certainly not dissipationless. I mean, their viscosity is... But, but you see, so that, that's why I said that the dolphins are better, because the, the dolphin rings leave for a very long time, no? They, they live... Uh, right, and water is, has plenty of viscosity. Well, but it's a matter of scales, again. So viscosity at large distances is always negligible. So it's a matter of how large do you have to go in wavelength in order to be able to neglect viscosity. For these particular scales, it cl it's clearly negligible because they can oscillate many, many times without ever slowing down. No? So eventually, I eventually agree with you. Viscosity will kill all fluid motion. No, but it's a matter of scale. Of it, it, it seems to me, well, OK, even the motion of the vortex ring through the, through the fluid at the local fluid velocity, that doesn't depend on? It does. It depends on, uh, on uh, neglecting viscosity. Viscosity. I agree. And viscosity is order one. And no, but order one, viscosity is not a dimensionless number, no, so I know. you I just mean, have to go. Yeah. Uh, right. But, and also in the superconducting case that you showed, yes. uh, 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 it's certainly. Uh, you mean this, this yes. part? Yeah, and that. There, uh, uh, I mean, the same thing occurs, you know, in type 2 superconductors. Uh, in, in, in general, uh, there are very strong viscosity. Yeah, that I don't know, actually. Yes. I'm not an expert. Yeah. We're talking about viscosity or resistivity for superconductors? There, there are effects of impurities okay. that are viscous. Uh, viscous damping effects. But I agree. I mean, everything I say will apply for zero viscosity or 
small, I mean, as long as you can but neglect these costs. What's surprising is that a lot of this somehow survives even with viscosity. Well, that, well, yeah. But again, it's a matter probably of uh, how big these things are. I claim that the bigger they are, the more you can neglect viscosity. Okay, so I'm uh, very short on time. So we want, to understand, we, have, we want to have an efficient way to understand these things because that integral differential equation, we don't like it because uh, uh, it's, it has an integral on the right-hand side. It's not obvious how to add corrections to it, like, for instance, coming from compressional modes, how these things interact with compressional modes and other fields, okay? So our approach has been to apply effective field theory. So let me give you a super short, short uh, uh, review of the principles of effective field theory. The idea is this. In many physical systems, you don't need to know what you're talking about, meaning you don't need to know the microscopic details of the system. Sometimes it's enough to isolate the relevant degrees of freedom at the, di at the distance scales you're interested in. The symmetry is acting on them. And then uh, the uh, Lagrangian, or the Hamiltonian that you write, will be the most general Lagrangian or Hamiltonian involving those degrees of freedom compatible with those symmetries. The reason behind this logic being that symmetries are so important for physical systems that the only robust properties of physical systems are those that are enforced by symmetries. And uh, everything else can be parameterized with a few parameters. So let me be... Uh, a little more explicit, so effective field theory is, has been developed for uh, particle physics, and the prime example perhaps is the pion. The pion is a bound state of quarks and gluons. It's very complicated, nobody knows how to solve it uh, analytically because it's a, it's a strongly coupled quantum system, okay? So you can think of the pion as a composite state of two quarks and many gluons. And, uh, uh, however, it so happens that the pion is light compared to its size, meaning that the Compton wavelength of the pion, one over its mass in natural units, is much bigger than the compositeness size, the compositeness scale of the pion, okay? And, uh, um, and so when you go to uh, long wavelengths compared to the compositeness size of the pion, and, uh, and uh, correspondingly low energies. What you can do is the following. You can associate a field to these particles, so a pion field, okay? You have to understand how the symmetries of the original theory, let's say, uh, quantum chromodynamics, act on the pion, okay? But once you know that, then the claim is that the Lagrangian that describes interactions of pions will be the most general Lagrangian involving the pion field compatible with the symmetries, and then also derivatives acting on the pion fields. And uh, this looks like a, an infinite dimensional set of possibilities because it's a generic function, okay? But uh, what saves the day is that you organize the Lagrangian as a derivative expansion in the sense that it will be special derivatives and time derivatives. And uh, as long as you work at frequencies much lower than the uh, energy associated with this compositeness scale and the distances at the wavelengths much bigger than the compositeness scale, okay? The, uh, this expansion parameter, which is the gradient times the compositeness scale and the time derivative over the compositeness frequency, these parameters will be small, okay? And so this will be a perturbative expansion at low energies and at large wavelengths, okay? So the idea of effective field theory is when you don't know the, micros the microscopic details or when you don't want to know the microscopic details of what you're talking about, you can still make progress as long as you work at distances much longer than the microphysical systems that you don't know. So in our case, for instance, we don't need to know what's happening at the core of the string, okay? We can parameterize the dynamics of the string as long as we look at very long wavelength deformations in a completely uh, model-independent way. I won't have time to go into the details of the construction, but uh, uh, one of the benefits of using effective field theory rather than just equations of motion is that uh, it gives you a Lagrangian or an Hamiltonian, which is uh, more economical 
than just having equations of motion. It's one functional of all the degrees of freedom instead of n equations of motion for all the degrees of freedom. Uh, yet it's more complete. It's more complete because uh, it has more information. So for instance, from the Lagrangian, you can derive the Hamiltonian, which is the conserved energy of the system. Whereas if you're given a set of equations of motion, it's not obvious to figure out what is the conserved energy associated with those equations of motion, if there is any. In general, if I give you a bunch of random equations of motion, there won't be any conserved energy. Whereas for Lagrangian, there's always a conserved energy. Uh, it's straightforward. Once you have the Lagrangian, it's straightforward to couple to other systems while conserving energy. For instance, I can decide to couple it to gravity, as I'll do later, to electromagnetic field, etc. Whereas if I give you the equations of motion for two isolated systems, and then I ask you how to couple them, it's not obvious how to couple them in a consistent way, for instance, such that there is a total conserved energy. There's another theorem that whenever you have a Lagrangian, it uh, links symmetries to conservation laws, and we like both symmetries and conservation laws, so that's a good thing. We can do quantum physics with Lagrangians or Hamiltonians, whereas it's not, it's not obvious how to quantize directly the equations of motion. And in particular, for superfluids, those vortex lines I've been talking about are really quantum objects, so it's natural to think of canonical quantizing the excitations that live on them. I won't have time to go through these details, and in fact, I just wanted to flash this, not to explain everything, but just to show you that uh, for superfluids, this program had been carried out by Son in 2002, and somehow there's a, there's a with symmetry considerations, okay, uh, in particular, you define a superfluid as a system at finite density, which undergoes Bose-Einstein condensation, or in field theory language, which spontaneously breaks a conserved uh, charge. Okay, it's the same, just two different languages for the same. And so this program, uh, so insisting on symmetries and figuring out what, this, what the superfluid is from the viewpoint of symmetry, tells you that the Lagrangian describing the bulk dynamics of a superfluid is completely determined, is the Lagrangian for a scalar field, and is completely determined by the equation of state of the superfluid. This function that defines the Lagrangian is really the pressure as a function of the chemical potential. So if you give me the equation of state of your superfluid, I can give you the Lagrangian. Okay? And now expanding this Lagrangian in small perturbations, so the perturbations of this scalar field are the phonons, so the sound waves of the superfluid, I can figure out how these phonons interact. For instance, I can compute scattering processes between phonons. What I'm really interested in today, though, is how to couple the bulk degrees of freedom of a superfluid or a fluid to strings, okay, to vortex lines. Now, the problem is that for a superfluid, at least, so this scalar that we're talking about is really what uh, in condensed matter uh, is called usually the superfluid phase, okay? And so the string, the, the vortex line for superfluid is a configuration such that the superfluid phase, this is like the phase of the wave function, undergoes a two pi rotation. So from the viewpoint of the scalar field that describes the bulk modes of the superfluid, the string is a topological defect and uh, the, the, the scalar is not single valued around it. And so uh, this is a minor complication. People who are used to think in terms of uh, electric magnetic dualities already know the solution. There is an, there's, there's an analogous, uh, the, if you want, there's a completely equivalent description of the same bulk physics, which instead of involving a scalar, involves a so-called two-form, meaning an anti-symmetric two-tensor. Okay? And this is exactly analogous to what happens in uh, ENM in the presence of magnetic monopoles. Now, as far as we know, magnetic poles, monopoles don't exist, so we don't use it in ENM usually. But these things do exist, and so this tells us that instead of using the scalar to couple to the bulk modes to vortex lines, you should use a, an anti-symmetric tensor. From the viewpoint of the bulk dynamics, these are completely equivalent descriptions. Now, this is slightly technical, but you can go through it. And uh, uh, so the bulk dynamics is described by this anti-symmetric tensor. And, uh, and uh, in particular, you can parameterize its perturbations in terms of two vectors. The counting is right, because an anti-symmetric Lorentz tensor has six independent components. So we have two three-dimensional vectors. And the string dynamics is parameterized by the position of each string element 
as a function of sigma, a coordinate that runs along the string, and tau, a time. Could, you could choose it to be, uh, let's say, usual time, or you can choose an arbitrary parameter for time. Okay? Now, I don't have uh, time to describe all the symmetries acting on, this, on these things, but they are Lorentz acting in an obvious way and uh, uh, a gauge symmetry on the two form and the reparameterization invariance for these two parameters, tau and sigma. I should say that I'm using this uh, relativistic notation not because I want to focus on relativistic systems, but simply because I find it uh, more convenient because given the four vector notation, it's really easy to construct invariants, so things that are invariant under Poincaré. For Galilei, which is an approximation to Lorentz, uh, it would be slightly more cumbersome, but you can do it. Okay? So if you prefer Galilei, you can do it with Galilei. Here I can use a relativistic notation and then take the non-relativistic non limit at any time, so I prefer to do it this way. You write the most general action compatible with the symmetries, and then you can expand. I don't, have, uh, I don't want to go into details, but there is an action that is the most general one compatible with the symmetries organized as a derivative expansion, meaning you, t you take only the leading terms at low energies. And then you do perturbation theory about the background that describes the superfluid. So there you have a, a bulk background field plus perturbations. And uh, for the string itself, you can take a background. Could be a straight string or a circular string plus perturbations. And you can do perturbation theory. Okay. So for instance, in this way, you can recover a standard result, which is, again, that the energy per unit length of a string depends logarithmically both on some IR scale, some uh, uh, container scale, uh, size, let's say, and the thickness of the string. So let me explain these diagrams. These are standard Feynman diagrams that people who are uh, used to doing perturbation theory in, uh, let's say, particle physics are, uh, know very well. So here, they are slightly different because there, is the, there are these planes. This plane is the so-called world sheet of the string. So you should think of one of the directions, let's say this one, as a direction along the string. And this direction has time. So this is the plane described by the string as it moves in time, as it lives in time, if you want. And the, the string, so this diagram tells us that the string can exchange bulk modes with itself. So this is just a diagrammatic uh, representation of the standard self-energy that you can have even at the classical level for any object. Let's say if I have a point charge at the classical level, the electric field generated by a charge carries some energy. This contributes to the energy carried around by the charge. Okay? So this is a self-energy diagram which is there already at classical level. You complete these self-energy diagrams and you find this logarithmic divergence, L is the size of the containers, and lambda is some UV cutoff in momentum space, let's say, which you can think of as the thickness of the string. Now, what's nice about the field theory language is that we also know how to uh, deal with UV divergences, okay? We have the renormalization program, which we can do directly at the level of the Lagrangian, or the action, and so in particular, the dependence on the UV cutoff is totally uh, uninteresting, meaning it can, from the field theory viewpoint, it can always be renormalized away, meaning it can always be reabsorbed into new terms that you can add to Lagrangian. In particular, a so-called tension term. People who are familiar with string theory will recognize here the Nambu-Goto action. So this is the standard action for uh, a string in empty space. Okay? Here the claim is that we need this term to, uh, to uh, reabsorb the UV divergence that comes from this energy per unit length. Okay? But, but on the other hand, the logarithmic dependence on the container size is physical, meaning that even after you renormalize away the UV divergent part, you are still left with this log of L. Okay? So this, in the language of particle physics, corresponds to a renormalization group running of the tension. So the tension depends logarithmically on the momentum scale at which you probe it. Okay? This could be either the size of the container or if you have perturbations of the string, that would be the scale, the that wavelength would be the relevant scale to talk about. And so in particular, this also tells us right away that once you go through renormalization of the tension for a straight string, 
Since the tension appears in the action as a coefficient, as a coupling constant, if you want, but then there is a full nonlinear structure for the fields that are attached to it, I can now use the same coefficient, which I computed here, for much more general situation, in particular for Kelvin waves. For Kelvin waves, I use just the same tension. I just expanded the Lagrangian now about a straight string at quadratic order in perturbations. I use the same tension, and I get the frequency of Kelvin waves, which now depends logarithmically on k, because the tension depends logarithmically on k. So I guess this is supposed to show that uh, um, the field theory viewpoint, in which you have a Lagrangian, and uh, uh, which is largely constrained by symmetries with only a few free parameters, is more economical in that even when you have, for instance, UV divergences, once you do renormalization for one of these parameters, T in this particular case, in a very simple, specific situation, like a straight string, okay, then you can apply the same coefficient that you just computed, the renormalized uh, value of that coefficient is mu in much more general situation. And so going from the straight string to the Kelvin wave spectrum now takes just one line, whereas in the Lord Kelvin paper case, it took him, I don't know, 20 pages. Of course, I mean, that was more than 130 years ago. So. <laughs> and uh, um, so we are late by 130, we'll be scooped by 130 years. <laughs> Uh, a benefit of this viewpoint is that the same tension, again, the same running tension, uh, can be used for nonlinear solutions. Okay? So, in particular, there is a nonlinear solution of this Lagrangian, this is the Lagrangian describing perturbations of a straight string, which corresponds, remember the magnetostatic analogy, corresponds to a solenoid type case. So, this is a string with uh, spires that are very close to each other, okay? So since the magnetostatic analogy tells us that I should associate a current to the string and V is the magnetic field, so the magnetic field in this case would be like this, constant inside, zero outside. So now if I replace the magnetic field with V, I have a solution of hydrodynamics because the string is made of fluid, okay? So I have a self-sustained solution of hydrodynamics which is a pipe that carries a fluid flow inside and zero outside. We call this a self-pipe. Uh, and it's a fully nonlinear solution of those equations. And uh, we believe it's true, even though, um, since it's a nonlinear solution, I cannot uh, take a wave packet of it, meaning I cannot uh, uh, use different wavelengths to construct a localized wave packet. So I'm not sure exactly how to test this experimentally, but maybe numerically in simulations one could use, I don't know, periodic boundary conditions and make it infinite. Because as far as, uh, so as far as this solution is concerned, this is infinitely expanded in the vertical direction. So I'm not sure. To, to, hmm? to, test, to test what? That there is a block of dependence? No, no, that there is this solution. Because this solution is not, I mean, we, we believe it, but, uh, uh, there's no other sign in the literature of this solution because it's well beyond what people thought to be yeah, possible. Yeah. The solution you're saying obtained by assuming that the tension is the, the slow very uh, running, is what you call running. Yes. By the way, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure why you call it running. It's just a two dimensional range function is over everything. Right? And the reason why it's being has a over everything is divergent energy because mm -hmm. two dimensional range function. Uh, yeah, well, running in the sense that there's a coefficient in the Lagrangian that depends logarithmically on scale. The renormalized yeah, value. Yeah, that's literally full on blowing in two dimensions. Full on blowing in two dimensions is all right. It's exactly the same reason. But why can't I call it running? Oh, no, you can call it running. But no, but I mean, why, why, why would you reserve running for other situations? What, what's so special about other situations? Oh, sorry, I mean, you can call it whatever you want. Yes. It's simply full on blowing in two dimensions. It's simply no, but I guess what I'm saying is that uh, I, I guess what I'm saying is that regardless of where it comes from, now there's a coefficient in the Lagrangian which multiplies a totally nonlinear structure, so I can use it in many different situations.
Yes, I'm just saying there's a coefficient. I'm, I'm just saying there's a counter term in the Lagrangian, and once I renormalize everything, I'm left with a renormalized coupling that depends logarithmically on scale. Yeah. In the, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's exactly that. Sorry, I should, uh, okay. Let me just uh, mention this, okay? So, this is the spectrum of, uh, these are experimental data, I mean, it's my depiction of experimental data, of uh, 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 ex uh, elementary excitations in uh, helium-4, okay? So this momentum, this is energy, they start, uh, so the, the, the dispersion law starts linear, and these are the phonons, that they have a linear dispersion relation. And then there are some features, there's a maximum and a minimum, okay? Now the features happen at a typical momentum, which is associated with microscopic distances, the real of order of the inverse interatomic spacing, okay? There's a gap. These excitations close to the minimum are called rotons, and uh, they're very funny in the sense that, uh, for instance, if you remember the formula for the group velocity, the group velocity of an excitation is the derivative of the energy with respect to momentum. And so if you are right at the minimum, it's just zero. So you have a finite momentum excitation, because momentum is finite here, but with zero velocity. In fact, if you are left of the minimum, it's negative. So you have excitations moving that way, but carrying momentum this way. And this is experimentally verified. You can propagate a roton, and then it eats an atom, and the atom recoils in the counterintuitive direction. Okay? And they're usually thought as a microscopic version of vortex rings, rings. And the reason is that Feynman came up with an ansatz for the many body wave function that reproduces the qualitative features of, of this curve when you minimize the Hamiltonian within that ansatz. And, uh, and uh, um, and it really, when you look at the ansatz close to this uh, minimum, it really corresponds to a toroidal velocity field, okay? Now, I don't have time to go into details, but the claim is that uh, these three things, phonons, rotons, and vortex rings are all the same, in the sense that they have the same quantum numbers, that is to say, the same transformation properties under space-time symmetries, okay? They, if, I, if I think of them as localized objects, they all break translations. They all break three-dimensional rotations down to some SO2, so a two-dimensional rotation. In the case of the phonon, is the SO2 around its momentum. In the case of the vortex ring, is the SO2 around the vortex ring. In the case of the roton, we don't know because we don't know what the roton is, but the claim is that let's assume that the roton belongs to the same class. And so now, they're different. the difference between all these systems is just a matter of how energetic you are, what's your momentum, okay? And that curve that we saw will tell you in what region you are. And so with this idea only, again, by applying effective field theory, you can construct the most general Lagrangian for a point particle with these symmetry properties. And it also tells you how that point particle couples to the background fluid, in particular to the phonons of the background fluid. And it's because the background fluid breaks certain symmetries itself, in particular boosts, and so uh, the, the way boosts are recovered in the Lagrangian uh, tells you how you couple to the, to the medium, okay? So in particular, you can use this idea to actually compute, I don't know, roton phonon elastic scattering, so these are the diagrams, again, Feynman diagrams we are using, and we found the same result as Landau Kalachnikov, very old result, uh, with some corrections. Somehow they, they, they forgot some terms. They, have a, they had a much more heuristic way to derive the same results, uh, but they, they, their heuristic uh, methods did not capture all the possible couplings. And uh, this computation is relevant to, uh, for instance, for viscosity of liquidium at finite temperature. Let me just conclude with a fun most fun application I think we have. Do phonons and rotons sink or float? We have no Archimedean principle for fluid excitations. No? So for a material object, we know, we, we know what its mass is and how much volume it displaces. If I think in terms of, of uh, localized fluid excitations, both at the classical level, like a sound wave, 
or at the quantum level, like a, a, a roton or a phonon. I don't know how much volume it displaces. I don't know what its mass is. These are vague concepts, okay? Because they are not perfectly localized. Again, effective field theory gives us the answer. Gravity is the gauge field for space-time symmetries. If I know how something transforms under space-time symmetries, I know how it couples to gravity. In this particular case, if you go through the details of this derivation, you discover that it's enough to replace the local chemical potential with chemical potential minus Newtonian potential. So these are the preliminary results. Phonons float. They want to bend upwards. Rotons sink, but in ways that depend on their orientation. A roton oriented this way wants to fall. A roton oriented this first wants to reorient itself and then fall. And this guy, again, wants to first orient its, reorient itself and then fall. Uh, in particular, liquid helium at finite temperature is supposed to be like uh, there is this uh, Landau two fluid model in which you think of liquid helium at finite temperature as being liquid helium at zero temperature plus a thermal bath of phonons and rotons. And so our claim would be that if these preliminary results are correct, there will be a separation with the phonons mostly collecting at, uh, at the surface of liquid helium and the rotons mostly collecting at the, at the bottom. I don't know if it's measurable because, again, these are preliminary results. Thank you very much. Sorry, I didn't, I, didn't, uh, I didn't do that yet. Now, the vortexes do couple to gravity. I have to figure out uh, how much. Because, yeah, in that video, it's pretty clear that they don't float or sink. So the effect should be pretty small for them. I, have to, I haven't done it yet. It's really a matter of, uh, um, you see, since uh, you are supposed to replace the local chemical potential with, uh, by the way, everything I said was for superfluids, but I can apply, I, can, I have a dictionary that applies to ordinary fluids as well. But let's say for the superfluids, it really amounts to replacing the chemical potential with chemical potential minus Newtonian potential. And the chemical potential enters uh, in how these things, uh, the parameters of this curve depend on the chemical potential. This is measured at, let's say, atmospheric pressure and, and uh, that's it. If you change the pressure of the chemical potential, the curve will slightly adjust itself. So it's really a matter of uh, looking at the equation of state and how these things depend on external pressure or chemical potential. I haven't done it yet. Thank you very much.